A very good evening and welcome to the Marianne Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Xuan Yeo and I'm one of the two Ath Fellows this year. Next summer, eyes all around the world will be on the city of Rio de Janeiro as the huge seaside city, home to about 6 million people, hosts the 31st Summer Olympic Games. Although the Olympics were promoted by Brazilian officials as a way to lift the spir city's spirits and fortunes, that has not turned out to be the reality for many people on the ground. Take the property market, for example. To quote the president of one of the city's largest real estate agencies, properties are going for the price of a banana in Rio. The oversupply of properties built for the Olympics has exacerbated shocks from a national recession and low oil prices. Dr. Teresa Williamson, our speaker tonight, will give an overview of Rio's recent mega event driven boom and bust, and the hope of actual of, and the hope of an actual implementation of policies directed towards favelas specifically. She will examine how favela communities have responded, developed, and grown resistance strategies in response to recent boom development policies in Rio. She will address what pre-Olympic Rio teaches us all about poor urban planning and development policies, as well as effective community organizing and resistance. Dr. Williamson is the founder of Catalytic Communities based in Rio de Janeiro. I learned today that five students from the Claremont College community have had the privilege of interning at CATCOM in the past year and a half. An outspoken and respected advocate on behalf of Rio's favelas, Dr. Williamson is also editor-in-chief of Rio on Watch, a watchdog news site and favela news service which has tracked the impact of the 2014 World Cup and 2016 Olympic Games on Rio's favelas. In May 2004, Dr. Williamson received her PhD from the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania and titled Catalytic Communities, The Birth of a .org, her dissertation won the 2005 Gilchin Lim Award for Best Dissertation on International Planning and was one of three finalists for the 2004 Barclay Gibbs Jones Award for the Best Dissertation in Planning. Dr. Williamson's Athenaeum talk is sponsored by funds from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I must remind you that as always, all video and audio, all audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williamson. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's last year I spoke also at Pomona, so it's amazing to be back twice at the Claremont Colleges in two years, and I hope to come back many more times and share information as things progress in Rio um, and uh, continue this friendship. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be speaking about Rio and the mega events, uh, the dynamics of urban change. Uh, we ha held the World Cup last year in Rio and next year is the Olympics. Uh, and our organization, Catalytic Communities, has been supporting and tracking, uh, supporting favela communities and tracking the changes happening in these communities over uh, not only the five years now since the Olympics were announced, but also the previous nine years since we started working with the favelas in Rio. Um, this talk, I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, our organization so you understand kind of where we're coming from. And I'm going to talk about uh, favelas broadly so you kind of see our perspective on these communities. Uh, there are a lot of perceptions that come with them, and so it's important to kind of highlight uh, how uh, our work, what, what, what light has been shed by our work on what these communities are and their role in the world today so that you then understand kind of what's going on with the Olympics and how it's affecting these communities. And then I'll talk about policies in Rio towards these communities that have come up uh, in the last few years in, with the Olympics coming and, um, and then how communities have responded to some of these changes and so on. Okay? So I'm going to start just with a little bit of background of myself. Um, I'm originally Brazilian. My mother's Brazilian. Uh, my dad's English. I lived in Rio till I was six, uh, in, um, uh, six years old, and then we moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, when I was growing up uh, in Washington after that, we'd go back to Brazil on vacation. And uh, you know, this was the map that was given out uh, for a good period of my youth, uh, adolescence. And until about 2010, this was the standard city map that was given out by, uh, at the airport. So it's, it represents the south zone of Rio. Uh, which is a small portion of the ultimate, the city as a whole. Uh, in this map, uh, you can see the beach neighborhoods, the Christ in the middle, the uh, stadium. It's kind of stylized around the tourist districts. Uh, and these are some of the same, these are some of the kinds of images that the city also likes to project uh, about itself. So when you think of Rio, you probably think about uh, New Year's Eve on the beach or carnival, you know, these kinds of festivities 
popular culture, samba music. Uh, you may think about, you pro for sure you think about the beaches, right? Uh, or in the bottom right, you might know that Rio has the largest urban forest in the world. So it's a pretty spectacular geographic city um, in terms of geographic uh, uh, qualities. Um, now, there's another side to Rio that the city government doesn't like to project, but that is uh, often very, that is also well known. Um, and that side is often seen in the international media uh, de depictions of the city. Um, these are images from you know, the 90s and the 2000s, uh, things like uh, landslides, uh, police occupation or incursions in favelas, high unemployment rates in the middle. Uh, that image is from the movie City of God. How many of you have seen City of God? Oh, wow, good, okay. So uh, that, we can, talk, we can talk a little bit about City of God later. Um, and then these images here of uh, street children, the massacre uh, in 1992, was well documented in the international media at the time uh, by police. The bottom right is buses caught on fire by drug traffickers. So Rio tends to, when people think of Rio, they tend to think of these two extremes. And they tend to think of them as extremes. Um, and when they think about them, they tend to associate these images with the South Zone neighborhoods, and they tend to associate these images with favelas. Uh, and favelas are the communities where I've been working now for 15 years. Uh, in 2000, um, I went back, I was doing my PhD in city planning, I went back to Rio uh, and started visiting these communities. Um, and actually, you know, I came in with a lot of these same preconceptions as other people. Uh, but when I started visiting favelas, I found something very different. These are the images that I took in my first few months visiting favelas in Rio. Uh, what I found when I started visiting these communities were basically communities working hard, self-organizing, to uh, manage and to respond to all sorts of local challenges, uh, whether it was sewage systems or housing, dance and after school programs, soccer, dental hygiene, cooperatives, organizing, basically any social environmental challenge you can think of, there were communities actively addressing these challenges. And so when I saw this, I had an idea, and the idea was simply to create an organization that would support this side of the favelas, that would uh, make these, support these local projects, uh, help strengthen them, uh, bring visibility to these efforts and to favela voices. When I took this idea to my doctoral advisor, I just mentioned it to him, he actually turned to me and said, why don't you start the organization and write your dissertation about it? So I had this amazing opportunity, um, and it was very scary at the time, uh, to start Catalytic Communities, and that's what I did. So uh, in 2000, um, I started Catalytic Communities. Uh, it's an organization that's, um, uh, again, that works to support these qualities of favelas. Uh, and uh, for our first 10 years, we had a range of projects. Uh, we ran a community solutions database. It was the first of its kind on the internet. It was an open database. This was before the internet was interactive and we would document local solutions from communities. We ran a community center in downtown Rio for local leaders where they would interact and network and use the web uh, and, and develop local projects. Um, and all of these early projects were focused around strategic training and networking of favela activists with broad networks of support. We then moved over and shifted gears by 2008, nine, and the reason is that all those early projects, we retired them, and that's because the internet had now reached every favela. People were now comfortable on social media. Uh, the internet was now interactive. Anybody could publish on it. And a range of changes were happening in Rio with public investments starting to happen in these communities. So everything we've done since 2010, and I'll talk more about the Rio on Watch project in a minute, but everything we've done since 2010 has worked on three other uh, goals or pillars of our work. One is to broadly communicate the issues and values of favelas based on community perspectives. The second is to develop and prove the value of participatory planning. And finally, to advocate on behalf of inclusive, integrative, and participatory policies. So our main project since then has been Rio on Watch. And Rio on Watch is short for Rio Olympics Neighborhood Watch. It's uh, our um, new site on favela perspectives in the lead up to the Olympics. And we launched this actually as an experiment in 2010 as part of our social media trainings to, for community leaders to learn how to use WordPress. 
So it was a, at the time it was a simple blog and it was a place for communities to, to document their perspectives. But what happened is very soon after that we started being uh, contacted by mainstream media outlets uh, who wanted um, access to information we were publishing and uh, specifically around evictions at the time. And uh, we grew that into a full news site. And that has led the mainstream media to reach out to us for a range of things, everything from opinion pieces in the New York Times to uh, supporting uh, TV uh, documentaries or public radio broadcasts um, and written pieces. So this is just to give you an overview of our organization's work over these 15 years so you understand kind of what we do. Uh, now I'm going to talk about favelas and what we've found them to be um, through this work over all these years visiting and working with uh, hundreds of these neighborhoods across Rio. First, I just want to give you a quick background. Uh, most people, when they think of favelas, they think of slums. They think of, and slums you tend to think of informal, uh, temporary, uh, new uh, kind of uh, developments where people have squatted, right? But Rio's favelas have actually been around, some of them, over 100 years. Um, and they came out of a, se a series of uh, of factors in the late 18th, uh, 19th century. So first, Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery in 1888. Um, and Brazil actually had, uh, sorry, Rio alone received five times the number of slaves as the entire United States. Okay, so to get context on the scale uh, of the situation. Um, so we had, uh, uh, we had um, abolition very late and uh, many Brazilians um, uh, were freed at that time. Uh, second, we had the worst land inequality in the world, so that means that there was no land available uh, for people to live. Um, but we had rapid early urbanization. So Brazil was already urbanizing over a century ago, and Rio was the federal capital. So that was the natural destination for people looking for opportunity. The central hillsides were uh, public land. Um, they were marked for preservation. So that's why they were, they were, they were uh, not occupied previously. Uh, but people came to the cities and to Rio, and uh, public land is easier to squat on than private land. So those were the natural destinations where people would settle. And then finally, there was no policy of affordable or public housing, which is, of course, common in the world at the time. So this is why favelas first formed. The very first favela uh, was settled in 1897 and it's today called Providencia. Um, but it was settled when soldiers uh, who had served battle in the northeast of Brazil, they were promised land in the capital of Rio at the time. And they came to Rio uh, to get that land. The land was not made available to them. There was no land. They squatted outside the Ministry of War. And after a few months, a colonel said, you know what, just go and occupy some land here I have on the hill, which they did. Um, they then named the community that they founded Mojo da Favela. Favela Hill. And the reason is the word favela doesn't have any relation to any of the translations we normally associate it with. It's simply the name of that plant. So you see on the right, top right there, that's the favela plant. Uh, that's the name of the favela that was on the hillsides in the northeast of Brazil where they served battle. And in homage to that plant, they named their neighborhood after it. Uh, but then over the subsequent decades, uh, all the informal settlements that sprouted up in Rio for those reasons we cited before. They became known as favelas, and then eventually Providencia changed its name to Morro da Providencia. Now, those early, that early history was followed by a sequence of policies in the 20, 20th century. Most important thing to note is that these communities were actively neglected by the government. They allowed them to proliferate. They ignored them. Uh, I was on a panel last year with somebody from the city planning department who actually uh, said um, uh, on the panel publicly, well, they were convenient because they provided cheap labor. So they were convenient because they were nearby cheap labor, but now they're not convenient anymore because uh, the, the, the land is valuable. So, you know, that, um, so there's this idea of, you know, you don't have to provide, if you don't you don't provide public services to them because they're illegal and also because if you do, you're formalizing them and then you have to recognize them and allow them to stay. But if you can keep them tenuous for this time, then you can remove them later. Uh, and this is the kind of underlying logic that, that, ran, that dictated policy for most of the 20th century. 
Now, there were periods where these communities were evicted, a few of them, especially during the military regime. And then they settled in public housing. City of God is an example. It started out as public housing that was built way out in the west zone of Rio when the city was, was not in that built out there. Uh, and people were moved from several favelas into the public housing. It actually became very violent, partly because people were from different communities were all put together in an isolated place far away from the urban fabric uh, without a lot of opportunity. And um, you know, we learned from that experience and others that actually public housing in Rio today is denser and more violent on average than favela housing. Uh, but that was mainly in the 60s and 70s where we saw the, the uh, policies of eviction until we'll get to the Olympics, right? Because that's an issue now again. Um, now, the criminalization of poverty has been, uh, has been uh, uh, a policy, basically, or it's been, it's been uh, an ongoing uh, issue and problem um, in Rio throughout its history, but it was really especially bad during the military regime when uh, if you were caught outside of your community, your favela, uh, without a, an official reason for being there, like a job, you know, a job, uh, official job, you could be taken in uh, and um, a record would be open on your behalf, on your name, under your name, uh, for loitering. And uh, so that would keep you from getting jobs. So the criminalization of poverty combined with um, the economic stagnation we had from 1975 to 2005, plus that lack of government support in these communities, those produced, uh, those produced perfect conditions for criminal activity to enter these communities. And that's why some people associate these communities, many people, with criminal activity. But we'll get to that uh, assumption later on as well. So things started changing uh, in 1988. So when Brazil redemocratized and uh, passed our new constitution, um, the, the, by this point, favelas had been around for 90 years. Uh, there were housing rights movements formed, um, and these organizations got together and uh, fought for a constitutional provision which was, uh, which was included in the constitution for adverse possession. Adverse possession is the legislation that says if you occupy land for a certain number of years and nobody convicts you of trespassing, it's yours. Uh, and so uh, it's common in cities around the world. In New York City, I think it's 20 years. Uh, as recently as 2003-ish, two buildings were actually given over based on uh, adverse possession or squatter's rights. Uh, in Brazil, it was put at five years in the Constitution. And it was a way of recognizing this, historical, this historic neglect and saying, okay, we're gonna recognize that uh, if you don't have housing uh, and uh, you've put public land to, this, to this, what's considered a good use for, for shelter, then we're gonna respect that right. So it's actually, Brazil has squatters' rights on the books as far as the constitution, local legislation and regional. Doesn't necessarily mean people get title. We can always talk about that if you guys want in the Q&A. Now, in addition to the constitution amendment, and also related to that, uh, the shift that happened. Um, in the 90s, Rio actually was uh, world recognized for a program called Favela Bairro, uh, where hundreds of favelas received upgrading. So by this point and by the early 2000s, both the Brazilian Institute of Architects and the Brazilian Institute of Engineers had, real, had recognized that the best way to deal with these communities once they're consolidated and they've been around a long time isn't to remove them, it's to upgrade them. And upgrading is sim simply the word planners used to say to bring, a c to bring the neighborhood to standard, right? And so in the 90s, hundreds of communities received upgrades. They weren't great quality. They didn't resolve everything. But that means that today in Rio's favelas, you have uh, almost universally the houses have plumbing, water, electricity, um, even if the quality isn't great. Now, as a result of the avoidance, lack of affordable housing, et cetera, um, today we have over 1,000 favelas in Rio and they're 23 to 24 percent of the city's population. It's a city in Brazil with the highest percentage of people living in favelas. Now they're all over the city, so this map shows a larger zone of the city than the pre previous map. The previous map pretty much uh, was those two blue circles on the right. Now you can see the city now another, uh, another uh, half of the city, and we'll show you a full map later. Um, showing the Olympic sites. But I show this map mainly to show the different favelas. You can see that they're all over the city. The reds and the oranges are all favelas. 
Now, 115 years later, or actually it's 118 now, Providencia just celebrated their 118th birthday last weekend. Uh, when people think of favelas, they often associate them with a number of stereotypes um, and preconceptions. And we've, we do an annual favela perception survey and we, we get at some of the data behind this, uh, what people think of these communities. Uh, but we hear all sorts of things. Um, and a lot of this is encouraged by the mainstream media. Uh, you can see a couple of quotes here from 2011 in Spiegel and ESPN. You know, the favelas, Rio's guilty conscience, almost a thousand of them overlook paradise but never, ever partake. And then the bottom one, you know, Peterson is 19. He says he's never gone beyond the walls of his favela. His life history is not atypical for the children in the ghettos. His father shot his mother dead when he was just two months old, as if this is typical in the ghettos, in the favelas, or anywhere. Uh, this kind of, these kinds of uh, assumptions that, uh, or, or preconceptions that are portrayed in the media that point to some of this. Now, the movie City of God is a great example of that. The movie is actually based on a fictional story that's based on reality in the 60s. The movie came out, I think, 2003. So people who watched the movie at the time thought this was a, an account of what was happening at the time. But again, the movie's based on a fictional account of what was happening in the si six, based on reality in the 60s. And the main character in the book, he wasn't black. There he is in the movie. Uh, in the book, they describe how he became violent through a series of events in his childhood. In the movie, they just make him look like he was born that way. So that kind of thing that comes out in the media, you can see it across the media. We'll get back to some of these later in a minute. But first, I just wanted to say, you know, when we read about favelas in the media, often one of these translations is used. Uh, but these are all inaccurate today. So squatter community implies that they're illegal. We already talked about squatters' rights that they've successfully uh, obtained. Uh, slum implies a level of squalor, which is no longer the case in the majority of favela environments in Rio. Sure, slum conditions still exist, um, but they are not the majority of uh, favela housing conditions. Shantytown implies precarious housing. And actually, over generations, the one thing favela residents most invest in is their housing. So uh, today, over 90% of favela housing is brick, concrete, reinforced steel. It's the same materials my home is built out of. Um, and families have rebuilt their homes now over generations. So they start with poor materials, then they improve the materials, then they add to that, and so on and so forth. And finally, ghetto, which implies violence, marginality, isolation. Uh, favelas are all over the city, and they're the main cultural contributors to the city. They're not marginal in any way. Uh, they're marginalized. That's different. Now, just looking at some of these data, I'm not going to go through all these, although we could. Uh, but just even just criminality, uh, which is the main one people associate with favelas. I talked earlier about the conditions that create crim or encouraged criminal activity in these communities. It's, there's nothing inherent about favelas. Uh, it's, it's, it's the lack of public investment. It's the, the lack of opportunity and the criminalization of the poor, uh, lack of education, things like that, right? Um, but even so, so if we think about uh, the high point of drug trafficking in Rio, which was about 2008, at the time, only 41% of favelas had drug trafficking. And even in those communities, only 1% of residents were actively involved. So even in communities with drug trafficking, uh, sure, all residents are impacted because that's who's governing the community. Uh, but they're not involved directly. And so um, when, we, uh, when we paint stereotypes and generalize about these communities, we're actually impeding their development. And then when we think about them in terms of economics, people often think, oh, you know, they're very poor. And, and I had a question today about this. People think of Rio's favelas, they're probably the most um, uh, kind of uh, negatively portrayed urban communities anywhere in the world are Rio's favelas. And there's this assumption of a level of poverty, which for the most part, they've already superseded. Um, but this was a study uh, done and published in this book called A Country Called Favela. Uh, and these are just some data points from that study. They showed that the average wage in favelas had increased 55% in the last 10 years, more than the national average of 38%. Favelas have more middle class residents than Brazil as a whole, 65% compared to 54% nationally. 94% of favela residents consider themselves happy. 
81% of them like favelas, 66% wouldn't leave their community, and 62% are proud to live there. So if you ask me, after 15 years working in these communities, what defines a favela, uh, this is what I'll give you. Okay, so basically, if I, all the communities we've visited, all the diversity of neighborhoods we've worked with, um, this is what they all have in common. First, they're neighborhoods that sprout from an unmet need for housing. So simply put, uh, you know, the, mar the, the housing market, the formal market doesn't provide housing for the lowest income residents of the city. The government hasn't accommodated them, so people create it themselves. Second, there's no outside regulation. So what this refers to is, you know, the government, there's no zoning, there's no kind of limits on building, uh, there's no standard, uh, standard protocol. And that is what can create very dysfunctional situations in some favelas, but it can also create incredibly vibrant uh, functional situations as well. It basically means there's no regulation, so anything goes. So things can be, um, you can get huge problems, and you, but you can also get incredible assets out of the process. And this is why there's so much diversity in these communities. Uh, third, they're established by residents. So this is important because there's nobody from outside coming in and developing an area and then providing it. You, uh, the residents do it up to their taste, their interests, their needs. Um, this also means that there's incredible embedded history in these communities because every tile, every brick, uh, everything that's been put in there was done by residents. Uh, so when you ask somebody in a favela about their home and how it was built, you get these amazing stories uh, about how, you know, my uncle did this, my grandfather did that, then we came in and did this, and then we added this. Um, and this kind of, uh, it's, it's when you're standing in a community and you really take that in, it's, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. Um, and then finally, they evolve based on culture and access to resources, jobs, knowledge, and the city. So what this refers to is, well, if a favela is in the south zone, it's going to be different from a favela in the north zone. They're, they have different access to different opportunities. Uh, if you're in a high air, a hill, you're different from a low lying. Those are different conditions. Uh, if a favela was settled in the 60s, it's going to be different from a favela settled in the 70s, um, it, depending on the personality of your leaders and their resources and knowledge and skills. You're going to have different outcomes. Uh, and then you multiply that, obviously, on the scale of time and geography and access to opportunity, and you get incredible diversity across the city. And then after, you know, as a city planner over the years, I've grown to appreciate a host of urbanistic qualities in these communities that planners like me associate with uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable urbanism. Uh, first of all, there are affordable housing in central areas. We talked about how uh, their favelas are all over the urban fabric. Um, they're living near work, so the idea, so every favela in their founding story, when you ask them, oh, how did your community start? Uh, they all will tell you a story about how, uh, well, we started when we came to build the metro station, so we're called Favela do Metro. Uh, we started when we were, they were fishermen here, uh, but then the racetrack was built, so it's Villa Autodromo, the autodrome vill village. Uh, or uh, we start, came with tourism, when, when tourism expanded, or when uh, the, build, the construction happened in the south zone, etc. So by definition, all these communities, they're, they're near sources of employment. They're low rise, high density, and this refers to, you know, uh, when you've got buildings side to side, but they're not particularly uh, vertical. Uh, so in a favela, you might have up to three, four, five stories max. Um, and when you think about old European cities, they are all built in this kind of model. Uh, this scale, like the dense, but, but, not, but, but not too vertical, uh, produces a lot more uh, exchange among community members. When you produce very vertical buildings, you, you have more isolation among residents, um, but also when you have people close together, then you are allowed to, you're able to have more exchange, whereas sprawl obviously wouldn't allow that. Uh, they're mixed use, so you have businesses below residences, so basically all your main needs are met within a favela in terms of a pharmacy or a market, a grocery store, cyber, uh, access to computer, when that started uh, happening, any kind of major uh, common uh, business would be available. They're um, pedestrian oriented, so uh, most favela roads are primarily used by pedestrians. Uh, cars can go in and out like you see on that one but it's mostly used by residents. There's a high use of bicycles in transit, 
Uh, organic architecture refers to uh, the way the favela environment allows you to build based on your needs. So for example, if you have a child, you add a room. Uh, when your child grows up, you add a floor. Um, when you become unemployed, you move upstairs and open a business downstairs. And that's responsible for a lot of the economic uh, growth in these kinds of, a lot, several of these elements help these communities, people in these communities develop. Um, and then there's the collective action, which is critical. So when you don't have a lot of money, you can do things together. Uh, and you don't need financial resources if you have support in terms of labor from your neighbors. So everything you see in that picture on the right of Mozama, which is the name of that community, everything except for the electrical wires was built by residents working together. The streets were paved that way, the curbs, the sewage system, the houses. They're cultural incubators, so pretty much everything you associate with Rio culture, whether it's samba music or carnival, whether it's capoeira or funk music or pasingu, the latest dance, uh, they were either created or they were developed and strengthened in these communities. And then finally, the high rate of entrepreneurship in these communities we talked about. So these are some images here. We've got the sewage system going in in Azabranca, where residents built it themselves. You've got people working together to build housing. You've got the inside of a house there that is completely finished. Uh, and, you know, uh, one of these houses in the Mozama picture. Now, just pulling back completely to a global context, one in, one in three uh, urban homes today is informal, but the UN predicts that one in three of all homes on the planet will be uh, informal uh, by 2050. That means that human population growth in our lifetimes is happening in urban informal settlements. Uh, there's a book called Radical Cities by an architect called Justin McGurk. And he found that 85% of all housing built worldwide is built illegally. Uh, this makes residents of informal settlements the primary developers of urban space in the world today. So we're talking about Rio being a context within this global context where these communities are actually about, you know, up to over 100 years old. But globally, this process is happening very fast, in, especially in Africa and Asia. Now, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, talking about the different human needs from the basic, most important physiological needs at the bottom. And I just put this up here to highlight that shelter is on the bottom. People need access to shelter. And interestingly, property comes above that under security. So uh, we often confuse shelter and property, but it's really important that we recognize that shelter is a basic need. So what's missing in these communities? Um, you know, we talk about, I talked about these communities maybe in a different way from what you're used to, right? Uh, it's not to deny that there are a lot of challenges. And when you ask people in favelas what's missing, uh, you can get lots of different answers. Now when we, in public uh, uh, consultations with the city or in meetings that we are part of with residents, uh, you always, unless it's a meeting around a specific topic, uh, when it's a general meeting, uh, the top three requests that we hear are uh, sanitation, education, and health. The order varies, but it's always those top three. Uh, so when we think about bringing in public services, um, I only put security above that because uh, it's widely thought among city officials in Rio that you need to have security first, which appears to make sense because, you know, if you can't, uh, in some communities, if you don't have a secure situation, you're not going to be able to provide these other services. So uh, assuming that, we've come up with this kind of recipe for integration, and I'll explain in a minute why it has an order to it. Uh, but the idea is to start up there with security. And this is, we as an organization, looking at the trends with city investment in these communities in the last few years, uh, recognizing, okay, so we start with security, which, again, is the assumption is that needs to come first. But then we go over here on the right to the government-provided, tax-paid public services like education, health care, sanitation. Those are the ones that the communities say they need the most. Those are the ones that are chronically... Uh, either, well, not missing completely, but low quality. Uh, and, and, and those are the ones that ha take a while to produce tangible improvements. So for example, you're not gonna, your education today isn't gonna result in a job tomorrow, right? You need to go through school for years. Uh, 
Same kind of thing for sanitation, takes a while to, 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 to introduce, to build, et cetera. So these maybe take five years until this middle phase around housing. Now housing, again, is where people are investing the most. So we don't need to provide housing. We need to uh, help maybe with building materials or maybe with helping bringing them up to standard. And then we come over to these. What these are are the market-based or oriented consumer-paid public services, things like utilities, like water, electricity. Again, water and electricity are already in all the favelas. The, qual the, the issue now is quality, and it's also you know, people paying bills. But people can't pay those bills until they've had better training, access to jobs. That's why the idea of integrating these communities, if that's really the goal of the city, uh, this, is the, this, this would be the logical order. And land titling comes at the end, and we've been encouraging collective titling, which I can talk about during the Q&A if you guys want. Now, I don't know why it didn't appear, the three objectives, but basically the idea of this recipe is to ensure residents take advantage of development, to build the capacity to pay and partake, and to avoid exploitation. So that's all background so you understand, okay, favelas, how we would integrate them, et cetera. So let's talk now about the Olympics. Um, so we, you know, we, I talked about how that we had 100 years of kind of neglect of these kinds of communities, except for some investments in the 90s. Um, now, things started changing uh, around 2009. And uh, this is a rough estimate, and, I, and things since 2013 have shifted with the economy uh, on a downturn. But I'm going to talk specifically around the time of the Olympics decision, which was late 2009. What are the shifts we saw around then? So before that, the economy had been stagnant for 30 years. It wasn't the Olympics that changed that. It was offshore oil discoveries that began changing that process. But the Olympic decision for Rio to host the Olympics, it meant um, that there was a lot more uh, uh, recognition of uh, much more trust that the city was improving. Um, now, the, at, after 2009, Rio's economy grew. It became the third economy in Brazil. We saw immigration grow. Uh, Rio had lost capital city and industry in the previous decades, uh, but then it was receiving double the international investment of Sao Paulo during this period. Uh, there was little political will before that. Political will shifted. We had a market-oriented government, um, both at the city and state levels, around shifting in 2008-9. There was little cooperation before. Then all of a sudden we had massive cooperation between the city, state, and federal governments. Uh, there was lack of trust in the city and state before that, but then Rio was hosted to host, chosen to host the World Cup final and the Olympics. Uh, now, what hasn't changed is inequality, and we'll talk about that later as well. Inequality is a, a major issue in the city, and that has continued to be the case. So, you know, we had celebrations on Copacabana Beach when Rio was selected to host the Olympics. Uh, sponsored by the state government. Um, there was a lot of excitement. You can see there was no other developing world city in the previous decades uh, chosen, and so it was seen as a huge, a huge vote of uh, trust and, uh, and recognition that Brazil was going to be able to host the games. Uh, we saw a major shift where the city started marketing itself very aggressively uh, to businesses from abroad. This is Rio Negócios. It's a a site, that, a, a, a site and business that was created by the city government to support and encourage international investment. Uh, you saw a lot of media, you saw a bunch of world events going on in Rio between 2010 and next year's Olympics. Every year we've had a major event. Uh, and Rio started taking out uh, ads. This was the state government taking out a nine-page ad in Foreign Affairs magazine showing that Rio was ready, gearing up for the games. Now, during this period, Rio's, Rio went from 23rd most expensive city in the world in 2011, so you already saw that growth by 2011. But by last year, Rio was already the 11th most expensive city in the world. And you see that circle over there? More importantly, Rio is a city in the world where the cost of living has gone up the most in the last eight years. So this was last year, so the economy's changed this year especially, so I don't know what the data point is today. But in the last eight years through last year, 86%, there was an 86% increase in the cost of living in Rio. Now, you can imagine in the context of the favelas uh, how that would impact residents. Now, uh, this is the IBM control tower that was launched to watch over the city, traffic, crime, weather. Uh, there's a massive rebranding exercise that we saw in this period. Uh, for example, ESPN did this piece, Deadly Games right around the time when Rio government was taking out this ad, right? 
gearing up for the games. Uh, this was the front page of the New York Times in two th October 2009, front page of the New York Times, October 2010. You can see a big shift in the way uh, Rio is being depicted in the media during that period. Uh, there's a mouth-watering video that was produced to win the Olympic bid. Um, and then there were the policies towards the favelas. So again, we talked about how over 100 years there was kind of state, the government ignored these communities, except for this one program in the 90s. But in 2000, between 2008 and 2010, a host of new programs were announced towards favelas all at once. Everything from community policing that was going to be more just and, and community oriented to full upgrading of every favela in the city by 2020 with architecture firms helping these communities uh, fully come up to standard to uh, you know, gondolas, libraries, the works. So I'm going to go through some of these briefly. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Let me see how we are in time. Just because I want to make sure we get to it. Okay. Um, so uh, the, I'm going to go through these about the policies more quickly so we can get to the kind of community reactions. Uh, but basically what we've had is the Federal Growth Acceleration Program, which has brought in a bunch of uh, investments in favelas around uh, infrastructure investments. Public housing, the largest public housing program in Brazil's history was launched in this period to provide millions of homes. Uh, the police pacification units, which are a state program to bring um, community policing into favelas. The social uh, part of the UPP that was supposed to bring in uh, all the missing infrastructure we talked or res uh, public investments we talked about besides security. Um, and Mora Carioca, the program that was going to upgrade the favelas. So this suite of programs from federal to local, right, um, what they all have in common is that they all s look great on paper. They were well designed in theory, okay? Um, when they started being implemented, people were very hopeful. The initial implementations were well done. But as the programs developed, uh, all sorts of issues arose, mostly around participation and the quality of implementation. So for example, in this uh, infrastructure program, well, the government came in and built that cable car in the bottom right, which has gotten a lot of international media, and this library in the top right. But when they did the months of consultation that were required for this program in the community, guess what Alemão, where the cable car was, guess what they had requested as their number one priority for the community? Sewage. They got the cable car, but they never got the sewage investment. Guess what Manguinhos, where the library is, guess what their number one request was? Sewage. They got a library. Two blocks away from the library, you walk in sewage to your ankles. So the assumption is that this is really marketing. They look great, they're good images, they sound good, but they're really projects that are intended to look good for outsiders. They're not actually responding to local need. And this is also what we've seen with the public housing program where you see the cracks that appeared in that unit before it was even launched. They had to build 19 million HAIs. That's like $10 million at the time. And then they had to demolish everything. So the public housing program it's, um, had major issues with the quality of the housing uh, in terms of construction, the rules that are imposed, the size of the units, the distance from opportunity. The pacifying police units started out well implemented. Some of those still are, the early ones. But as it scaled, uh, we started hearing all sorts of cases of torture, police violence, uh, and mistreatment of residents. Uh, this program became basically a data crunching project. They collect data on what people in the favelas want and need, but they don't actually provide services. And this program was completely abandoned. It was only implemented for one year during uh, an election year. Um, and then since then, the mayor says it's being implemented, but actually he's just using the label because it's got a good publicity associated with it on anything the city does in favelas, even evictions. And this is the mayor of Rio, who's very charming, uh, but he says the city of the future has to be socially integrated. Favelas are part of the solution. He's very convincing, but in reality, this isn't what's going on. And we started seeing this wasn't what was going on 
uh, in 2010 when we did our social media trainings. And we were hearing from communities. We had 180 leaders from all over the Rio region in our trainings. And uh, they were all on social media at the end of this process. And of course, we were connecting to other communities we had been grown to know in our early years of work through social media. And we started hearing reports from these communities about what was actually happening when these policies were being announced. And these policies were announced, again, around when the Olympics decision was made. Uh, they were part of the marketing that Rio was getting better and that was investing in these neighborhoods. So now this is the whole map of Rio, so you get a sense. The very first map was that tiny little part on the right where the sun is. Uh, this is the whole city. It's over two hours uh, in good traffic from east to west. So we started hearing, this is Favela do Metro. Uh, it was located where that P is right here. Most of, most of the residents of, or sorry, the first set of residents evicted from Metro were moved to Cosmos. Now we heard about this in late 2010 and we sent a volunteer out and he recorded it for Rion Watch. Um, we started uh, doing videos about some of those early evictions happening in 2011. Uh, communities were contacting us uh, mostly through social media already, but a lot of it was happening on people's private uh, walls. So if you're not friends with them on Facebook, you weren't hearing about it. This is an example. JV was, uh, was one of our community journalism students the year after in 2011. He's from the north zone of Rio, so on this map, he would be near that, uh, the cable car, the blue cable car over there. Uh, but he, in that post, he was talking about the favela called Vila Autodromo, represented by this volcano. Now, those two communities are two hours apart. Before social media, they wouldn't have, he, Jacques Davy wouldn't have known what was going on in Vila Autodromo. Uh, but now he was aware, and he posted about it. Within an hour, there was a 116 comment thread, all from young people within the north zone of Rio, where he lived, talking about what was going on in the west zone. Now, this was unheard of before. Now, it took six months for the mainstream global media to pick up on the Metro story that this eviction was going on uh, and how cruel that particular eviction was. Now, this is another uh, community. A couple of years ago, Tanki, we were called there on a Friday, uh, told that the evictions had started, that they were going to be evicted on the Monday. There were some Australian TV crews here at the time, or an Australian TV crew here at the time, or in Rio at the time, and we took them there on Monday morning to cover the story. Um, as a result of these journalists being there, the compensation offers for the families that were still fighting went from 8,000 reais, which at the time would have been about $4,000, up to 45,000 or $22,000 over the course of a day. Just to show kind of the impact that the international, the, the, the kind of spotlight can have even on specific outcomes uh, at the time. Now, um, we also, you know, uh, when you follow Brazilian media, there's a great article, I didn't include it here, I should have, uh, out just a week ago in the New York Times, I recommend everyone read uh, about the influence of Brazil's global media uh, empire on public opinion and how it keeps people, uh, inf it, or how it informs people, misinforms people. Um, but this, uh, this is an example of that. Uh, this is a story out last year about uh, this community that was going to be removed uh, for the Olympics. And in the article, they talk about how happy the residents are with the public housing they're, they're being given. Uh, they don't talk about any dissent. Uh, we were contacted at the same time by a group of 100 of the seven, 800 families there who, were, who wanted visibility because they were fighting to remain. Now, we were the first also to talk about the gentrification issue in favelas, which has died down a little bit now because of uh, the economic downturn. Uh, but that was another thing we started hearing from communities. Uh, that's in, produced quite a debate internationally and domestically about gentrification of favelas uh, to the point where the Financial Times buying guide uh, was issuing, or the Financial Times property section, House and Home, was uh, uh, publishing a buying guide to the favelas where it says, what you can buy for 100,000 pounds, several three-bedroom concrete houses in Vigigal, that's a favela. 
300, uh, 500,000 pounds, a two-bedroom apartment close to Ipanema Beach. So implying that it's a better investment if you buy in the favela. Even Fox News started talking about this through Associated Press. So, um, and then at the same time as that was happening, and of course this is changing now with the economic downturn, uh, but um, there are a lot of luxury, well this is still happening, there are a lot of luxury buildings going up all over Rio while affordable housing is, is not meeting people's needs. Uh, this is the main example, the biggest example, uh, where uh, the Olympic Village that's going to house Olympic athletes uh, is, um, uh, is going to turn into a luxury development called Pure Island uh, with claims of sustainability. Um, this is, these are images from a few years ago and repeated now just to show that this has been common knowledge for a few years now from the Federal University of Rio, from the State University of Sao Paulo, showing the shifts of people in the city and the green, the green in the bottom one is people leaving, moving, being moved to yellow zones. At the same time, we've seen a growth in the occupation of abandoned buildings in Rio. So we're seeing this major shift happen. The Olympics basically created this pretext, this period where uh, local, traditional, you know, the policies, these policies would have had to be debated under normal circumstances. Uh, they would have had to be approved by the electorate. But because of the Olympics window, it creates a, what people call, academics call a state of exception, where you've got a period of time when anything goes and where officials can get away with things because they can say, we have to do it for the Olympics, we have to get the city ready, um, and, and who's actually making decisions are a small group of developers. And so we see these shifts. Now, this is really important in terms of inequality statistics, which unfortunately we don't have the latest data. This is only through 2011. But it's already to show that we have this uh, national trend of inequality going down in Brazil, the green, the light green, while in the state of Rio, in the city of Rio, which is the aqua colored, inequality has stayed pretty much stable. And there's uh, indicators showing that inequality has actually been going up the last couple of years. We just haven't seen the graph updated. You can see the racial breakdown in Rio, how uh, the, the South Zone beaches are, uh, or beach neighborhoods are mostly white. Um, and the uh, mixed race, the green, um, are in the northwestern, and uh, the red, which are blacks, are black, you know, Afro-Brazilians are mainly in favela areas. So we see a very strong segregation r on racial grounds within the urban fabric. Um, we also have issues around police abuse, which have been heightened in this period uh, following the Olympics decision. And now, this is the positive side of all of this, is that the international media is now paying attention. So around 2010, again, we saw the international media coming to Rio. Uh, that's part of Rio and Watch's role has been to kind of inform and support the production of or information flow around what's happening in favelas um, in this period. But the international media often is able to see things and cover things in a way that the Brazilian media aren't. One of the most positive legacies of the Olympics in Rio is actually the kind of national conversation, uh, local in Rio, but also on a national level, around issues because the mainstream global media have all flocked to Rio. So we have reporters on the ground. Uh, this was a really uh, important piece on NPR. Uh, this is, I highly recommend everybody read this. It's beautifully written. Uh, and it's incredibly informative. This is a piece in Globe, um, in uh, the Globe and Mail, a uh, Canadian newspaper. Uh, they spent months researching it. There's a video that comes with it uh, talking about race in Brazil. Now, if you, again, on the issue of police violence, which is associated with race, um, but, you know, by 2008, this is just one of the articles on Rio and Watch from a series we did on the history of the police, uh, but is important just to, to highlight. So by 2008, the military police in Rio were killing one person for every 23 arrested. In the US, that's one for 37,000. So we have a trigger-happy police. Um, there was a case of Amarildo a few years ago that came uh, public. Again, this is, this one, this is a, an important case around showing the role of social media. Uh, his case came to public awareness within a day of his disappearance. The police took him in for questioning, and he never came out. 
and he was innocent, he was a bricklayer, everybody in the community knew him. When he didn't come out, they, start, they knew what had happened, they realized immediately, and they started posting to social media. This was in 2013 during the big protest movement, and his case quickly became um, uh, discussed on a national stage. Uh, a month later, they took in, uh, they convicted 20, over 20 police officers of torture in his case. Again, an innocent person tortured by over 20 officers, um, it's insane. So I just show this again, the recipe for integration, because uh, in the context of what's been happening in Rio, we see the opposite. So what's actually happening? So when favelas get the security that comes with the UPP force, the police force, um, the South Zone favelas, that triggers gentrification in some communities where uh, in central areas and, and wealthier areas. But the government's been coming in on the left-hand side first. So they come in and they start charging people for their electricity, for their water, which sounds like something you should do, except that uh, people haven't been prepared for that. So this is a recipe for gentrification. So in Rio, the government's actually actively uh, funding gentrification in these communities under the pretext of poverty alleviation, because all of these programs, including the police, were associated with poverty alleviation. It was all the idea was we're going to have this, all these different programs and they're going to help integrate these communities and alleviate poverty. So how have communities responded to all of this? Uh, it's a different map of Rio, it's just showing the different zones of the city. Now this big pink area here on the west, that's the west zone. That's the area that's grown in the last 30 years. That's the area where the Olympics developments are mostly. Uh, where uh, a lot of the new luxury housing is being built in the inner west zone, sorry, here. And it's also where the public housing is being built out in the extreme west zone. So this is a community, just response of Favela do Metro. Um, this community uh, is, again, the one that was, I showed earlier, it was the, near the World Cup Stadium. They were moved to the extreme west. I just want to highlight this particular case. Uh, because it shows the role of community response to all this and how resistance uh, can work. Um, but it started with 700 families in the community and the city came in and uh, uh, removed 100 overnight. It was, they showed up one day, they said, here's a form, you have to sign it. If you sign this, you get public housing. Uh, if you don't sign it, you don't get anything. It was this kind of intimidation. Those are the 100 families that were the most fragile and vulnerable. They didn't know their rights. Uh, often they were elderly, um, and they, they went. Now what happened was the city then used that, those 100 empty homes, to demolish, to create these really rough conditions for staying. The other 600 families, they fought. To, they, they decided to band together and fight. And they actually united. They got a new uh, president of the Residents Association, and they started fighting the eviction. They went to the public defenders, opened a court case. Again, they have the rights um, on the books. It's a matter of using them. And they fought. Now, uh, over the next few months, because the city had demolished these hundred houses, it became unbearable to live there. Because of the location of this particular favela in the middle of the city, uh, it started attracting you know, drug users with needles who would leave needles. You started uh, having issues around rodents, around cockroaches, around criminal uh, uh, people coming in and, and, and assaulting residents. And so the, it just became really unbearable. So they started fighting for, to be relocated, but to be relocated next door because there was public housing actually being built next to this community, but it was supposed to be for middle class, uh, for middle class families. So they said, well, no, there's public housing being built next door. If you're going to remove us, you have to move us there. And that's what they fought for in the courts, and they won. Now, in this particular case, if they had all 700 families, and actually today, the community is still demolished. Theoretically, this was for the World Cup. The World Cup happened last year, and the community is still demolished. These are different pictures throughout the process, uh, but some of these are similar to how the community looks today. Okay. Um, now, it wasn't necessary for the World Cup. It was an opportunity the city saw to remove that community. Uh, now, the fact is, though, that those residents that, uh, if, if everybody had fought together, they would have still been there because there was no need for this area. Now, they didn't, but the ones that were united and that fought in the courts and so on, 
they managed to uh, be relocated nearby. And that case and others uh, that we've covered over the years have pointed to several keys to successful resistance. And I just like to show this because it's, I think it's informative for everybody who's dealing with, you know, any, anywhere really. Um, it, what we've found is that, first of all, access to information is critical for these communities. So the, knowing their rights, knowing the context of what's going on, knowing what other groups are out there, that kind of thing. Now the legal defense is, it, once you know your rights and you know you can fight for them, well then the legal defense is the next thing that you need to work on. And the reason is not necessarily because you're gonna win, although some communities have won, but because that buys you time when you open a court case for the next item which is actually the most important, which is unity. The more united the community, the better the resistance. And a community that's complete, the, the city has not managed to remove one community that was actually fully united. Uh, and usually the way they, they end up removing communities that are fighting and resisting is to try to find out who in the community uh, is, is breaks from the, uh, from the others and try to, uh, in, in, to, to uh, intimidate or offer things to that group in a way that will generate uh, some community members to leave and then the, the city is able to remove them. Now the broad networks of support, so that's things like uh, universities, human rights organizations, uh, the church, any outside support networks, diverse resolute leadership, so the more different kinds of leaders with different personalities, different qualities, uh, the better. Uh, creative responses, so I'll give a couple of examples of that, and early and ongoing visibility, and that's what our organization has worked on. So these are cases from Vila Autodromo. This is the favela next to the Olympic site. We've written over 80 articles since 2010 covering this community. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it was not, it was the original Olympic plan. The community actually was maintained. You can't see it that well, but it's in the top corner there. And actually, when the, um, this is the future Olympics, like the original picture sent to the International Olympic Committee. That one over there is the uh, legacy image for 2030. And you can see the community still in the top left there. Uh, and this is the community responding to the city's uh, uh, removal of residents by saying, okay, you c we've removed those houses, but you can keep the rest of the houses, and this is how you can replan the community to integrate it into the Olympics. Um, now, legal defense has worked in several cases. Providencia has actually managed to uh, maintain itself because the, based on participation claim, the, the, the city didn't involve them in the process. Uh, these are communities using other creative channels. This is residents plastering large images of who's being evicted on the sides of houses. They managed to save a, a street that way. Um, in the middle there is a community that mapped its history in response to people saying this was a new settlement. Uh, on the right is Villa Autodromo's popular plan that uh, this is again the community next to the Olympic site. They've been updating regularly a plan that shows how they can be incorporated into the Olympics project rather than removed. Uh, there's been movements where communities have taken advantage of, so, so quickly just show this picture first actually. Um, this was the large protest of 2013 uh, which were basically, we, we had over 300,000 people in the streets of Rio that this particular night, but the protests were happening on a weekly, sometimes daily basis for months. Um, and uh, people basically were complaining about all the money that was being spent on the World Cup when all of the sorts of public services were being, uh, were being def underfunded and, mob and transportation was, the prices were going up and that's what initially triggered these protests nationally was transportation prices going up. Um, now, this big protest was the last big protest we had in Rio and the reason is that the police basically came in on all sides with gas bombs and scared everyone, including myself. Um, and, uh, and, but the, the positive side of, that, of, of, of all that, uh, when, this, when this protest was depicted in the media um, that night and following days <coughs> in Brazil, it was depicted as violent. It was depicted for a lot of things that weren't actually happening. Now, one in 20 people in Rio were there on this night. Just imagine one in 20 people in a major city like that. They go home and they tell their friends, first of all, what the media are reporting isn't what happened. I don't trust the media anymore. 
Second, the police violence. Now I know what it feels like. So the police violence that happens every day in favelas now became something that the average person in Rio had been exposed to. And both those things have helped shift public perception over the last couple of years, both about the media and the police. So communities like Marea, when they've had massacres by the police uh, recent, or shortly after that protest, they were emboldened by the fact that the public now had a different concept of the police. And a lot of the movements that have been brewing over the last couple of years have built on that, this recognition. Now, networks, this is Vijigao, the community that's facing, that, was, that has been facing the most severe uh, gentrification. These are community leaders from lots of different community organizations getting together to discuss what to do. One of the things they've done is to lead a series of debates in the community uh, that have turned out hundreds of people to talk about gentrification and the impacts and what can be done. Now, the visibility and documentation, now that's uh, shifting where more and more communities are doing it directly. So um, nowadays, uh, people in favelas are using their cell phones to document what's going on. Uh, this was the case of a community collective of photographers documenting the occupation of a community and saying their cameras intimidated the police in the acts of house searches and also calmed residents who told them that without their presence, the police approach would have been different. So this idea of documenting this process, this kind of a, this uh, recognition has been really critical, and now communities can do it for themselves. Something Rian Watch does regularly now is we look at the quality of international reporting on these issues, and we will publish articles that say, hey, these are the best articles lately, these are the ones that are problematic. We call attention to the media when they misreport or when they uh, produce more stigma or stereotypes. Now, increasingly what's happening, and this is the latest kind of trend, uh, communities <coughs> are, because of this process where the ma major media have, are in Rio and they're aware and they've been connecting with these communities, uh, the mainstream media is now more and more uh, bringing visibility to these local efforts. This is a New York Times Magazine piece earlier this year and a fusion piece, both talking about this collective of community journalists that go out and document police brutality on their cell phones and put it up on social media. And now The Guardian even has a column, a regular column, by two community correspondents from favelas that are reporting directly in The Guardian through the Olympics. So we're seeing a big shift where these local voices that were isolated are now directly projecting into the mainstream global media. So concluding vision, kind of pulling back from the Olympics in general and just thinking about uh, after the Olympics and what Rio could, in theory, offer the world in terms of, uh, in terms of solutions from these communities. Um, you know, there's growing movement among uh, researchers, urbanists, architects, but also other groups uh, to view favela qualities and study them. Uh, this is a group out of Australia that says that the favelas seem uh, to have this ability to reconfigure themselves based on needs. Uh, they're not over-designed or predetermined. The separation between public and private spaces isn't as strict, allowing for strong adaptation between the two. Uh, this kind of idea that these communities have qualities, right? There's a, a movement also in the planning profession in general. This is Oxford University. Uh, they now have this um, program on the future of cities, and they have this flexible city initiative. This idea that cities should be flexible, that Planning is important, but we should allow for spontaneity and flexibility and adaptation. And favelas have a lot to teach us in that sense. Uh, there's growing recognition that favelas are the affordable housing stock of Rio and that we should recognize that. Um, and then, you know, then thinking broadly, you know, what would the future of Rio be like uh, if instead of kind of labeling these communities and top-down policies, we shifted and we said, okay, they've been developing on their own for so long. Um, why don't we look at the assets of each of these communities individually? Why don't we build on these assets while we bring in uh, the missing um, support services, right? Uh, what would Rio be like if the favelas, if we recognized their individual contributions and we integrated them into the city in this way? And this is an image of Santorini, Greece not attempting to suggest favelas should be like this uh, or that, uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, often we, we it's, it's all about the lens with which we look at things. Uh, this is considered beautiful, right? It's a world heritage site. Uh, and, you know, there is nothing 
uh, inhibiting Rio's favelas from being equally or even more uh, important and recognized in the future um, if we, you know, thought about them through a uh, different lens and focused on investing in them and uh, through a just, um, a just approach and creative approach. Um, and then finally, again, there's one third of humanity is going to be in urban and formal, or sorry, in, yeah, one third of all humanity will be in urban and formal settlements by 2050. Uh, Rio's got the oldest, some of the oldest of these informal settlements in the modern world. Uh, we've seen how they develop, we've seen the assets they develop. Um, what if we integrate them in a way that we can actually serve as a model? Instead of thinking of these communities as a blemish on the horizon that need to be removed, uh, which is totally counterproductive because they're going to exist. Uh, what if we accepted that and we worked to integrate them in ways that were productive? So uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I went a little long. Um, uh, these are some of our social media uh, bits on the right here if you want to sign up. Oh, that on the top right is our monthly digest. Uh, one of our staff members works incredibly all month documenting all of the media publishing on favelas in English. Uh, and at the end of every month, we send out an email, which puts it all into one email for you, uh, and also publishes all the re and watch and gives a little summary of the month. Um, so if you sign up uh, or email me, I have some cards here, uh, you know, you can get access to that. It's a great resource uh, if any of these in issues interested you at all. And then on Facebook, those are our organizational and Rio and watch accounts, and same for Twitter. The very bottom one, um, Rio on Wire, it's a Twitter feed that's a wire service. It uh, covers everything that's going on in English in favelas. So every hour at least, there will be a, uh, an update saying, OK, this is what's going on in favelas right now. There's this event going on. Or there was this shooting just now. Or there was this, uh, this um, uh, uh, protest. Or uh, this community event is going on, or this city event, or whatever. And it provides background and context, and it's super easy to follow. And basically, it's us making it really easy for the media, researchers, anybody who's interested in following these things who doesn't speak Portuguese uh, to know what's going on on the ground. So I encourage you all to follow all that, and I look forward to questions. And thanks for having me. We now have time for questions, so if you have one, please raise your hand, and Schwen or I will come to you. All right. Thank you very much for your talk there, both today and at Pomona last year. Yeah. Um, and so during the like background portion, when you were talking about the favelas, I was struck by the fact that um, they have all these positive attributes that urban planners, um, when they are like designing communities, deliberately try to produce and often fail to produce, like cultural dynamics. And, a focus on pedestrians, um, all those attributes. Um, and so I was wondering if you could elaborate on like, what lessons you think that urban planning in a more like deliberate, ordered sense um, could draw from the flexibility that's been afforded to the favelas? Great question. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, I think part of it is to, is to observe um, what happens kind of naturally in the space uh, already in any given space that a planner is going into and trying to detect those assets and the qualities before you do any intervention so that when you're designing the intervention you're, uh, you kind of say, okay, these are the things we want to keep. Um, this is one thing I think I've l we've learned in Rio and, and then when you're developing interventions, doing it with the communities in mind, uh, they're the ones who need to be, in, you know, engaged in the process. Um, now, uh, I think there's also the element of not over planning, um, and not dictating all the rules, uh, trying to um, t trying to be responsive to uh, the. Um, you know, trying to leave openings for the spontaneous things that happen. Uh, one of my friends who did his PhD with me at Penn, when we were in the same program at the same time, he did his research on a skate park in Brooklyn uh, that had evolved 
organically, naturally on the waterfront. And um, he ended up producing a book that was published last year called The Accidental Playground. And it was about how this incredibly uh, effective urban space had evolved completely naturally through the community. Uh, it was later developed into this like private project. But, um, but the, 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 and it was last year recommended for one of the reads for de Blasio, for when he, by the New York Times, I think it was. It, it, but this idea that we, and it, so it's not just Rio, right? It can be the US too. But this idea that this kind of, we should be learning from these places, we should be observing them. When those things happen, we should be encouraging them. Um, when we see functional things evolving naturally, that's what makes cities vibrant and exciting. And that's what the initiatives like, you know, Oxford and other programs are trying to recognize is that uh, in a lot of, we've, we've had several interns from Europe who have come and who are from a planning or architecture background who have said, you know, in Europe, like we over plan and we're trying to pull, figure out how to pull back from that. Because then you kill the vibrancy that makes cities what they are. Um, now, I don't know exactly what elements um, other than trying to create room for spontaneity and then observing that when you see the assets, then you learn and you figure out how to support more of that. When you see the problems that sur surface, you work with residents to address them, that kind of thing. I don't know if that. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have tonight, but oh, please so join me in um, thanking our speaker for okay. tonight. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stick around if anyone has questions, and I have cards here, and I'm sorry the talk tends to go long. <laughs>